This is a reading from St. Ludwine of Scheidem, continuation of chapter 1. St. Ludwine and St. Colette were born in 1380, that is to say, in the year that St. Catherine passed away, and both gave their lives for the Church by suffering, in the one case passively and in the other actively. Although leading absolutely different existences, their lives presented some resemblance. Both were born of poor parents, and from being fair to look upon became, by their own desire, ugly. Both endured ceaseless and agonizing pain. Both bore the stigmata of Calvary. Both, when they died, recovered the beauty of their youth and had a sweet and, split and pleasing smell. During their life, they were both devoured with the same thirst for tortures. Only Colette remained, in spite of all, active, for she had to traverse France from one end to the other constantly, while Lidwine traveled, if at all, motionless on a bed. Finally, they resembled one another in this, that each was a savior of her country. St. Colette's mission was identified with that of Joan of Arc in repulsing the English. She helped with the superhuman comfort of her tears, whilst Joan took the material side and fought at the head of her troops. Colette took command of the spiritual, she reformed the convents of the Clarices, making ramparts of mortifications and prayers, threw into the struggle a penitence of the nuns, clung to the skirts of the Virgin, till she had obtained the defeat of Bedford and Talbot and the enemy that had finally withdrawn. Lidwine, by the power of her devotion and her torments, protected Holland when it was invaded by the wastrels of Burgundy and prevented a fleet from attacking Scheidem. Like St. Bridget and St. Catherine of Siena, St. Colette was called to combat schism in person and by visible means. She intervened with St. Vincent Ferrier at the Council of Constance, and she tried also some years later to prevent the Council of Pisa from introducing a false pope. Lidwine did not take, humanly speaking, any share in the tribulations of her unknown sister, who struggled so violently against erring cardinals and false popes. She could hardly have known, buried as she was in her Dutch village, of the distresses of the church, except through such knowledge as her confessors possessed. But she certainly had revelations from the Savior, and in any case, the accumulation of her sufferings was a treasure of war, upon which, although doubtless ignorant of its source, both Colette and St. Francis of Romaine drew. The latter was specially chosen for those tasks which schism rendered necessary, Younger than Colette and Lidwine by four years, Francis was of noble birth and allied to a husband who counted a pope and a saint amongst his ancestors. She differed them by her origin, her fortune, and her condition as a married woman, from the two virgins, her sisters. But if she, but if she differed from them in some points, she emulated them in others, or rather, she borrowed from, them, from both of them, becoming the spiritual child now of Colette and now of Lidwine. She resembled the Virgin of Corby by her active life, by her vocation as leader of souls and founders of an order, by the part she assumed in the politics of her day, by the battle she fought with the demon who assailed her. She resembled the Virgin of Scheidem by her miraculous cure of the plague, by her perpetual contact with angels, by her voyages into purgatory in quest of souls to deliver, by her special mission to atone for the crimes of the period as a sacrificial victim of the suffering church. By means opposed or by means identical, these three women, each bearing the stigmata, strove against the evil influences of their time and accomplished an overwhelming task. Never, indeed, had the equilibrium of the, of the world been so nearly overset, and it seemed as if God had never been more careful to adjust the balance between virtue and vice, and to heap up, when the load of iniquities preponderated, the tortures of his saints as a counterbalance against them. This law of equilibrium between good and ill is curiously mysterious when one thinks of it, for in establishing it, the all-powerful appears to have wished to limit and put restraints on his own omnipotence. That this rule should be observed, it is necessary that Jesus himself should make an appeal to man. As reparations for the sins of some, he claims the mortifications and prayers of others. And this is indeed the glory of our poor humanity. 
but although he so respects the liberty of his children that he will not take away their power to resist him, never has God been deceived. All through the ages there have been found saints willing to pay, by their sufferings, the ransom for the sins and faults of others. And even now, this generosity is difficult for us to understand. Besides our own nature, which shrinks from all suffering, there is also the evil one who intervenes to frustrate the sacrifice, the evil one to whom his master has conceded in this sad earthly contest two most formidable weapons, money and the flesh. He also preys upon the cowardice of man, who knows, however, that the grace of the Savior will avail to assure him of victory if he only tries to defend himself. Would one not say that after the expulsion of Adam from paradise, the Savior, importuned by the rebel angel, had disdainfully granted him the most sure means of vanquishing souls, and that the scene in the Old Testament where Satan asks and obtains of God permission to tempt and try the unhappy Job had already been rehearsed at the expulsion from Eden. Since those times, the needle of the compass has oscillated. When it inclines too much to the side of evil, when man becomes too ignoble and kings too impious, God allows epidemics to be unchained, earthquakes, famines, and wars. But his mercy is, much, is such that, when, that then he excites the devotion of his saints, enhances their merits, even practices a little deception with himself, that his wrath may be appeased and equilibrium re-established. Had it been otherwise, the universe would long ago have been in ruins, but the resources Satan has at his command and the weakness of the souls to which he lays a siege, one can understand the constant solicitude of the church, charged as she is with the task of lightening the balance of sins and continually adding a counterweight of orison and, paint and penitence. Orison means prayer. One can understand the need for those ramparts of prayers and citadels of supplication which she erects at the order of the spouse, for the strictness of her pitiless cloisters and stern orders, such as those of the Clarices, the Calvarians, the Carmelites, and the Trappists. And one can conceive of the incredible sum of sufferings endured by the saints, those griefs which the Most High distributes to each one of us to purge us, and to make us share a little in that work of compensation which follows the work of evil step by step. Now the dissoluteness of society at the end of the 14th and the beginning of the 15th, 15th centuries was, as we have said, deplorable. The 13th century, which in spite of its conflicts appears in the midst of time so pure and blameless with Saint Louis and Blanche of Castile, so chivalrous and pious with the faithful leaving they're all to snatch the sepulcher of Christ from the hands of infidels. This century of vast cathedrals, which knew Pope Innocent III, St. Francis of Assisi, St. Dominic, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, St. Gertrude, and St. Clair, was indeed little better than dead. Faith seemed expiring and was destined, after dragging on through two centuries, to perish in that sewer, disinterred by paganism, and known as the Renaissance. To sum up, if we examine the state of Europe in the days of Lidwine, we see cutthroat nobles seeking to destroy one another, the people reduced to misery by war and rendered either ferocious or insane through fear. Most of the sovereigns were either rogues or maniacs like Charles VI, Peter the Cruel, Peter the Ceremonious, and William of Holland, unbalanced like Jacqueline, drunkards and libertines like Wenceslas, emperor of Germany, or cruel and pharisaic like the king of England. As for the anti-popes, they crucified the Holy Spirit, and when we consider them, we are moved with fear. If only that were all. But one is bound to go further and admit that those who were consecrated to God's service were no better. Schism was rampant, and those to whom it had been entrusted to guide and to guide the bark of salvation were themselves steeped in sin. One has only to read the sermons of St. Vincent Ferrier, reproaching their turpitude, the invectives of St. Catherine of Siena, accusing them of cupidity, pride, and impurity, and of trafficking in the graces of the paraclete to realize the enormous weight which they have added to the balance of evil in the scales of justice. Before such a total of sacrilege and crime, before such an invasion of the cohorts of hell, it would have seemed probable 
that in spite of their courage and devotion, St. Lidwine, St. Colette, and St. Francis of Romaine would have succumbed if God had not raised armies for their succor. It is more than possible that they never had any knowledge of these armies, any more indeed than the armies themselves knew of their mission. For the Almighty is the sole master in this strategy, and he alone sees it in its entirety. The saints are in his hands like pawns, which he places on the chessboard of the world at his will. Their part is to abandon themselves, body and soul, to him who directs them, and to do his will without asking to know more. It is only when one examines the resources made use of by the Savior and the diverse instruments which he employed that one succeeds in catching glimpses of the tactics by which he subdued the hordes led away by the rebel angels. The number of those militants who, at the end of the 14th century, took arms under Christ for the assistance of Lidwine and the two other saints can hardly be estimated. Some of them are known to us, others will probably always remain unknown, while others again appear to have been specially occupied in changing the scene of operations. Without fear of mistakes, however, one can name the troops engaged in the first line who advanced under shelter of the prayers offered in those mystic fortresses which were defended in France by the Clarices of St. Colette. In Italy, the Clarices of St. Catherine of Bologna, the cloistered tertiary Franciscans of Blessed Angeline of Marciano, the reformed Dominicans helped by Marie Mancini of Pisa, the Blessed Clare of Gambacorta, the tertiaries of St. Dominic, who adopted the cloister under the, rule, under the rule of Margaret of Savoy, the Cistercians, whom Pope Benedict XII had brought back to strict rule, the, Sar the Chartreuse sisters who still revered the memory of St. Rosaline, all these were interceding on behalf of the saints. The troops of the advanced guard were formed by battalions of Franciscans and preaching friars. The first marched under the orders of St. Bernardin of Siena, who was born in the same year as St. Lidwine, and filled the mission like that of St. Colette in strengthening the relaxed rule of St. Francis. His disciple, John of Capistran, who sustained him in this task, was more especially occupied in company with the blessed Tom, Thomas Bellaccio de Linaris in opposing the heresies of the Fraticelles and the Hussites, Saint Jacques de la Marche, who was joined with him to fight against the infidels, Saint Matthew of Agrigente, who restored the ancient usages in the religious houses of Spain, Blessed Albert of Santiano, who was more particularly charged with a war against schisms, were also the leaders of the van. Those of the second line were led by St. Vincent Ferrier, the miracle worker who evangelized the miscreants, by St. Anthony of Florence, who struggled against the works of magic, by Blessed Marcelin, whose knees, from constant contact with the ground, had become like the knotted bark of trees, by Blessed Raymond of Capua, confessor of St. Catherine of Siena, who with John de Medici and Laurent de Ripafrata stimulated the lax piety and renewed the neglected customs of the religious, by Blessed Alvarez de Cordova, who worked for the extinction of schism, and in the same manner as St. Vincent Ferrier converted idolaters. Those troops, destined by the very nature of their vocation to the labors of the apostolate, accustomed to the task of enlightening the ignorant and prepared for the duties of an advanced guard, were extended like an interminable battle front at the head of the immense army of the Lord, of which the two wings spread far and wide. One, composed of the seasoned regiments of the Carmelites, was commanded by their prior, John Soreth, who quickened the fervor of his declining order and created the Institute of the Carmelites, by St. Anthony Dauphin and the blessed Stanislaus of Poland, who were martyred by Jean, who were martyred by Jean Arundin, prior of the House of Bruges, by Ange de Medzingi, who helped to, perform, to reform the rule in Tuscany, by Bradley, raised to the bishopric of Dromery in Ireland, whose austerities were famous. The other wing was composed of the serried masses of the Augustinians, who had been rallied and reformed in Italy by Ptolemy of Venice, Simon de Cremona and Augustine of Rome in Spain by John d'Alarcon, who introduced into old Castile convents of strict obedience while their third order had just blossomed out into a flower of the passion, Blessed Catherine Visconti. And these new, newly drilled regiments enclosed detachments that were weaker and badly armed. The, Cam the Camaldules, who in the disorder of their ranks could still count a learned monk, Ambrose Traversari, 
and two saints, Jerome of Bohemia, the Apostle of Lithuania, and the Oblate, and the Oblate of Daniel, Bridgetons, both monks and nuns, hardly born into the religious life and badly prepared to serve in a campaign, the Servites, whose discipline was being strengthened by Anthony of Siena, and whose standard bearer was the tertiary blessed Elizabeth Picenardi, the Primontarians, whose rule, like that of the convents of Fontrevaux, which Mary of Brittany was soon going to remodel, was so relaxed that their power to help was almost negligible. Between these two wings, behind the advanced line of the children of St. Francis and St. Dominic, spread a mass of resisting strength, the bulk of the, of the army, the dense and massive center of the most flourishing order of the Middle Ages, the Order of St. Benedict, with all its great divisions, First, there were the Benedictines proper, directed in Germany by the abbot of Castells, Otho, who restored the ancient use of the order, and by abbot Jean de Medin, who converted the dissolute customs of 147 abbeys in Italy, by Louis Barbo, abbot of St. Justine of Padua, who resubjected numerous monasteries to the severe, the severe rule of the order, amongst them that of Mont Cassin, the cradle of Benedictine rule, in France by the abbot of Cluny, Aldo de la Perrière, the cellarer, Étienne Bernadotte, the prior, Dom Toussaint, a nephew of St. Colette, who was, by reason of his virtues, compared to Peter the Venerable, by William of Auvergne, cited in the Chronicles as having been a veritable saint, by Blessed John of Ghent, prior of St. Claude, who interposed between the King of England and the King of France to try and induce them to make peace. Then came the Cistercians, led by the Blessed Eustace, first abbot of Jardinet, and by the venerable Martin of Vargas and Martin of Logroño, who reorganized the Bernardine houses of Spain, the Celestins, who dele delegated one of their most holy monks, Jean Basson, to be confessor to St. Colette, and were all well reputed and much relied on in France, the Olivetains, well seasoned and led to the assault by the venerable Hippolyte of Milan, abbot of Mount Olivet, by brother Laurent Ser Nicolai de Perouse, by the lay brother Jerome of Corsica, who died in the order of sanctity at the convent of San Miniato at Florence, by the venerable Jerome Mirabelli of, of Naples, and by the blessed Bernard de Versailles, who founded two convents of the order in Hungary. Finally, there were the Humiliates, in whose cloisters we find the oblate blessed Aldo Brandesca, famous at Siena for her miracles. In enumerating this army, the chosen legion of recluses must not be omitted those women who lived a hermit's life, which St. Colette herself had lived at Corby for four years, the female anchorites buried in the deserts of the east or voluntarily walled up in the towns, and to whom a little bread and a jug of water were passed through an opening in the door. The name of some of these holy recluses are known to us, such as that of Alice de Bourgot, interned in a cell in Paris, of Blessed Agnès de Moncada, who by the teaching of St. Vincent Ferrier betook herself, as did Madeleine, to, to weep on the sins of the world in a grotto, of Blessed Dorothea, patron saint of Prussia, who sequestered herself near the church of Quidzini in Poland, of Blessed Julie de la Reina, who incarcerated herself at Certaldo in Tuscany, of Peron Hergolds, a tertiary of St. Francis, who bore the stigmata and retired into a hermitage in Flanders, of Jeanne Bourdin, while walled up at La Rochelle, of Catherine van Boersbeck, a Carmelite who buried herself in a sort of cave near sanctuary outside Louvain, of another daughter of Carmel, Agnes, who was found some years after the death of Lidwine, still walled up in a retreat near the Carmelite chapel at Liege. These were the flower of the servants of Jesus, the guard of honor of Christ, from whose ranks sprang St. Catherine of Siena, St. Lidwine, St. Colette, St. Francis of Romaine, and Blessed Jeanne de Maillet, all victims most particularly pleasing to God, the living effigies of the Passion, the standard bearers of the Lord, the stigmatized. In Germany, there was a tertiary of the Franciscans, Elizabeth the Good of Waldus, and the Clarice, Madeleine Burler in Italy, a tertiary of St. Francis, Lucy de Norcy, a Clarice, Marie, Marie de Massa, a widow, Blessed Julienne of Bologna, and Augustinian, St. Rita de Cassi, and the ecstatic Christine, of whom the name, although without details, has been preserved by Denis the, Carso Denis the Carthusian. 
In Holland, there was the Dominican Bridget and the Beguine Gertrude of Oosten, and who can say how many more lost in the ancient annals or fallen into complete oblivion. To these active troops may be added the soldiers attached to no regiment who fought as partisans in their own countries, such as Blessed Peter, Bishop of Metz and Cardinal of Luxembourg, or St. Lawrence Justinian, Bishop of Venice. These inflicted on themselves incredible mortifications to expiate the sins of their times. And among them were Jean de Kenti, the Apostle of Charity in Poland, St. Jean Nepomucin, the Martyr of Bohemia, and Blessed Marguerite of Bavaria, a friend of St. Colette. Finally, there was a reserve corps recruited amongst voluntary laics, laics and priests or monks who had not been carried away by the assaults of the devil. Thus, at the entry of this vast army into the war, marching under the banner of Christ, the scales regained their equilibrium between good and evil. At first sight, this army was imposing, but on closer inspection, it was evident that if the chiefs who led were admirable, the troops placed under their command were wanting in cohesion, irresolute and feeble. The bulk of the contingents were furnished by the monasteries and convents, and as we have just seen, Disorders and factions were rife in the cloisters. Rules were dying, and the greater part of the statutes were dead. The phalanx of those serving had consequently no enduring piety and were hardly exercised in the first steps of the mystic way. It was therefore before all necessary to reform the squadrons, to recall the religious to the forgotten use of their arms, to equip them with new offices, to teach them once more the practice of mortifications, and to restore their knowledge of the wiles of sin.